So welcome everybody to the AME Virtual uh, Energize Your Journey series. Um, I've muted everybody to start with uh, to make sure that we can get through the, the uh, prelim very, very quickly. So before we start, I just wanna give you a, a two second tutorial on Zoom. If you look in your top right hand corner of your Zoom window, you'll see speaker view or gallery view. If you click, click on speaker view, it'll be much better for you. You'll, you won't get so distracted with everybody, okay? So today's keynote is uh, Paul Akers, who uh, obviously is a passionate lean maniac like most of us. Uh, but before I get into introducing Paul, I just wanna say a, a little bit about AME. We're a not-for-profit organization. And um, we have to obviously still get a little bit of revenue through uh, funding in order to keep our platform going. So I'm going to uh, provide you all with a link, okay, in the, the chat. So hopefully I'll send it to everyone. Um, and this is a link to, um, to make a donation to AME if you would like it. Anything from $1 to 100,000, which is great. Um, so if you feel like uh, giving a donation to AME for all the value that we provide, that would be fantastic. Um, last thing on the logistics, I just want to inform everyone that our annual conference uh, that we've got scheduled for October uh, is actually going virtual because unfortunately we're in Canada. Um, I'm, my name is Richard Evans, I'm president of AME Canada and uh, our prime minister won't let us cross the border <laughs> or let anybody in. So we're now going virtual. So we do have a new um, virtual conference page and I'm sending that to everybody as well. So please make sure you go and visit that conference page to, uh, to make sure that you get all the latest and greatest from uh, our value conference, okay? So without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our keynote speaker for today. And uh, at the end, we're gonna have some questions. We're gonna allow time for questions. We've got about an hour scheduled, but Paul and I will stay on for longer to answer all your questions afterwards. And we just want you to um, send me personally a, uh, just a, a little chat that says question and I will ask people at the end in the order that you send me the question. Don't send me the actual question, just send the word question and then I'll point to you and then you've got the platform to ask Paul anything. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Paul. Um, Paul, uh, as, as everybody knows, is uh, an entrepreneur, a business owner, a lean maniac. He's written four books. He's gonna talk a little bit at the end about how you can Hi. listen to his books free of charge. Um, he's an innovator. Uh, he's actually um, innovated lots and lots of things with FastCap and it's a really cool. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Paul. Paul, you got the platform. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, Richard, and uh, everybody else who's listening. So I prepared a talk today for AME that I've actually never done before because I've been pondering what it is that I do every day that garners the success that I have as a human being, as an individual. And so I'm going to get going right now. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share the screen and then we're going to make sure we share computer sound and we're going to optimize screen and we're going to share Okay, Richard, everything good so far? Richard, can you hear me? I can, yes, I am, okay. I'm, I'm muted. It looks perfect, lean is everything simple. Everything looks perfect, okay, lean is simple. So for everyone that's listening, typically if you've ever heard me speak, I always title my talk, Lean is Simple, because for me, lean is very simple. But I was literally thinking about this yesterday. What is it that Paul Akers is doing that garners the success that I have. And so you ready? This is it. It's simple. 
I stop. So lean is not simple. Lean is stop. What the heck are you talking about, Paul? Well, I will explain in a few minutes exactly what I mean. So as we get going on this talk, the first thing and the most important thing you need to understand is I cannot teach you anything. You come here to this conference and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to learn something because Paul's going to teach me something. I'm not going to teach you anything. You can just forget about that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to show you what I'm doing and what we're doing at FastCap and what I've taught, excuse me, retract that word, what I've shown everybody around the world what we're doing and why people have such wild success with the two-second lean model. So I'm only going to show you. I'm not going to teach you. And so I learned this co concept in Japan from Mr. Yoshino. I teach and work in Japan about six to eight weeks a year uh, at Lexus and Toyota. And, and I take tours over there and I train people about the Toyota production system. And Mr. Yoshino was one of the original people that taught the Numi workers how to think differently. These were the Americans that were surly union people. He brought them to Japan and he taught them how to think differently and show them show them what Toyota was doing. Because he thought, you know, I'm a young Japanese engineer. I can't possibly teach these accomplished Americans who defeated us in the war and on and on and on how to do anything. They're not going to listen to me. I'm just a young Japanese engineer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my thinking, because this is all about changing your thinking. And I'm simply going to show these surly American union workers what Toyota is doing. And that was the key. And in four weeks, one week of classroom training, training and three weeks of working one-on-one -on -one in the Toyota plant, the, the Americans were converted because of what the Japanese workers showed them. And it was really an amazing story what had happened. So this is Mr. Yoshino. When I was in his office in Japan, he started to tell me the story on how he did it, because this was his, his, his task, is to convert, if you will, or show the American workers how to do it. And this is his exact words. You ready? So we're going to take a trip real quick to Japan. So I was assigned to the training manager, but I don't know what to do. So you're going to try to change the culture of the ex gene people? Oh, go ahead, do that. It's, it's not impossible. Easy. Impossible. And only three weeks. How, how can we change the attitude? So, what was the key, Mr. Yoshino? So, we decided, okay, let us just show them what exactly what we're doing and let them decide what they need to do. We, we decided not to use the word teach or not even coach. So the minute you said you were teaching them, then it kind of made them seem like they were below you, but you didn't That's make right. them feel that way That's at right. all. So that is what we agree with each other. And Do you know what? I've heard a lot of people say a lot of great things before, but I think that might have been one of the top things I've ever heard. So needless to say, Mr. Yoshino changed my mind about really what I'm doing. I'm not teaching anybody anything. I'm simply showing them. And so this video really demonstrates the concept of this talk today. Lean is stop. Watch what happened at the Numi plant with the Japanese. It's the most amazing story. Could Toyota take one of the worst factories on earth and make it into one of the best using the exact same workers? Toyota's first step was to send workers like Madrid to the car makers Japanese factories. There, Madrid saw a worker misthread a bolt. And then, something totally unexpected happened. The worker reached up to pull a rope hanging overhead, and boom! Boom, they stopped the line. They stopped the line to repair it. Gee, that makes sense. Fix it now. That impressed me, that they want to build a quality car. One bolt. <laughs> One bolt changed my attitude. That was Toyota's philosophy, that workers should be empowered to stop an assembly line or invent new tools or do whatever else they feel like they need to do in order to get things done. The idea is that if you give workers the authority to take control, you'll not only unlock innovation, but motivation. After Toyota implemented lean management in Fremont, within just two years, the worst auto plant in the world had become one of the best. If you want your team to take more ownership of their work, then give them more power. Put the responsibility for solving a problem with the person who's closest to that problem, regardless of what their title is, and then step back 
and watch the productivity skyrocket. So what is it that FastCap's doing? What is it that Paul Akers is doing? We are stopping, just like Rick saw the Japanese stop the line. That makes sense. We are stopping and we've empowered our people to stop anytime they want during work and fix things. And specifically in the two second lean vernacular, fix what bugs you. So I'm sharing all this with you right now. And some of you could say, hey, this is crazy. It's, this is completely your decision what you're gonna do with this information. You can reject what I'm saying. That's not a problem. I'm not gonna push anything on anyone. I'm simply gonna show you what we're doing. Or you could say, hey, I'm really open to new ideas. This is interesting. I never thought about really all we're doing and all Toyota has done is they see a problem and they stop and fix it as opposed to living with the problem in, in, in perpetual uh, motion, just nonstop that, that problem nagging at them as they work through their daily work. And so this is a new concept of stopping. And you might think, I know what all of you are thinking right now, well, I'm never gonna get anything done. Well, just the opposite for me, you know, I literally this morning, getting ready for this talk and getting up in the morning, I literally made no less than five to eight improvements. That, that just doesn't even sound possible. In the first two hours of my day in my home that is nearly perfect, and everything around me is nearly perfect. I made eight improvements. How could that be? Because the second I move in my space, in my process, I see things, I go, oh, that was not quite right. That's a little clunky. If I do that, my wife's gonna be happier. Let me fix that now, let me change this. I am just constantly thinking this way. And the result is the accumulation of all those improvements are gathering and following me through the day and following me through my life. So every day I'm in a state of flow, getting so much more done than most people get done. You know, you think about what I do every day. I have a company that has 800 products where, where we do business in over uh, 3,000. We have 3,000 distributors worldwide. We're in 40 countries. I'm running five major construction projects because I'm also a builder and I'm writing books. I, I just, I have uh, this cacophony of people interacting with me every day. And you'd think I would just be overwhelmed by the whole thing. And I'm just the opposite. I just watch everything spin to completion because I teach, retract that word, I show everyone that I'm working with that we are going to stop and fix what bugs us. That's what I do. And this is a new concept. Or you can keep going just like this is hamster and keep doing the same thing you've been doing and being driven crazy and wonder why nothing ever gets better. But that's not the world I live in. The world that I live in, everything's getting better all the time. And you know, Lean is not a superhero program. I'm not a superhero. People don't come to me, oh, we gotta get Paul, he's gotta solve all the problems. No, I'm surrounded by superheroes, if you will, because everybody has been shown and developed to improve everything they do. So we're not looking for a superhero program. We're not looking for a person that's gonna solve all the problems. That is the opposite of what we're doing. And we're definitely not looking for bureaucracy. Oh God, everybody loves these charts and graphs and they like to put all these metrics up on the board. I don't do any of it. You couldn't find one of those in FastCap if your life depended on it. We don't have any of that stuff. What we do have is training of Ono's principles every day, training of Deming's principles every day, watching videos of improvements, everyone sharing the problems they have. We bring all of our problems to the forefront, we share them openly, and then we implement a countermeasure to solve them. 50 people doing this every day. We don't get caught up in the charts and graphs at all. And the result is, our company keeps growing just in insanity. It's crazy the growth we have at the same time with the same number of people. How does that happen? Our costs keep going down. Our quality keeps going up. Our wages keep going up. Our profit keeps going up. And our cost of labor keeps going down. It's unheard of. I've never heard of any company ever accomplishing what we do. And we do it because we stop. 
That's all we do. We just stop all the time. So this is not the flavor of the month. This is not, hey, I'm going to try this. You have to be committed to this concept philosophically. It won't work if you just say, hey, I want to try this for a little bit. That's not the... That's not the personality of the people we're looking for. In the, we're looking for people that recognize they want to be contrarians. They want to think completely different. Stop and fix what bugs you now. Just like Rick saw the Japanese. Hey, that bolt didn't work. Stop the entire line. Why didn't it work? Go upstream. Solve the problem upstream. Don't put a Band-Aid on it. Solve the real issue. So this requires total participation. This is not a few leaders who are the lean gurus, the black belts, the green belts, and all that stuff. No, this is everybody becoming a lean maniac. Total participation system. Okay, so we're going to take another trip real quick here. We're going to go back to Toyota City, and we're going to learn about Shigeo Shingo and Taichi Ono. So Shigeo Shingo, as many of you know, is one of the... the premier engineers in the world who helped Taichi Ono with the development of the Toyota production system. Taichi Ono was one of the top engineers at Toyota, became vice president of Toyota, and he really developed the Toyota production system. And these are two amazing human beings, and I am friends with Shigeo Shingo's son, Richio Shingo, who was former president of Toyota China and is just an amazing guy. And I spent a lot of time with Richio in Japan and in the United States. And I was on a bus with Richio in Japan and I asked him a question and listened very carefully to his answer. I asked him a question, if I'm sitting on a park bench and I meet you, I've never met you before and you introduce yourself as Richio Shingo and you say you're the president of Toyota China. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So I've heard a lot of good things about Toyota. What, what exactly you guys do you know, with this Toyota production system? I, I don't really know what it is. And I ask you, you explain to me, what is the Toyota production system? And I don't know anything. So this is from a high level Toyota executive. Listen to his answer. Because while Toyota sometimes presents lean as being this very complicated uh, system that is filled with charts and graphs and, and all kinds of craziness everywhere, if you really drill real, if you drill down really deep, you'll find out what it's all about. And here's Richio Shingo on what to the Toyota production system is. And I sit down next to you and I ask you what you do and you tell me I'm an expert in the Toyota production system and I said to you, what is that? How would you describe that? You know nothing and I should tell them, tell you. Oh, okay. I should tell you what the TPS is. Ah. TPS is the accumulation of small ideas of everybody. It's a, it's a... Love it. Perfect. To. You don't need to say anymore. <laughs> to. Okay, so did you get that? The accumulation of small ideas from everyone. Stopping, fixing why the bolt doesn't work, fixing why I can't pull my car into the garage, every time in the exact same place and putting a mirror in so I can see it. That was my improvement this morning. I put a mirror so that I could see how close I could get to one edge without damaging my car. Why did I want to do that? Because of respect for my wife. So when she pulls her car in, she has plenty of room to open her door, get the groceries out, get the dog out and not struggle with banging her door. So if I move my car over, so she has more room thinking of her, not of me, then I could do that. So I made an improvement to do that. I stopped and fixed what bugged me so I could help my wife. Very servant attitude in the way you deploy lean thinking. Are you thinking about other people? So this is Ken Snyder, Dr. Ken Snyder, head of the Shingo Institute. And I was speaking at the Shingo conference and I, Ken and I have become friends. He's a great guy. He also teaches in Japan and we work together. And <laughs> Ken is just an awesome guy. And so Ken told me a story about Shingo. And this story should really shock you. But before you hear this story, I want you to look at my hands. Do you see my hands? There's a little dirt under the fingernails. They're a little scarred. They're a little beat up. Why? Listen to Ken. You queued up. Hey, Ken, you were telling me about what Shingo said about the wasted 10 years. What was it? 
He spent 10 years studying statistical quality control, uh, a lot of Deming's work and things like that. He, got enam he said, I got enamored by it. I loved it. And then after about 10 years, he gradually began to realize it was a waste. And he calls it his lost 10 years. Why did he call it a waste? Is because he was focusing on measuring and controlling defects instead of eliminating them. Instead of doing it. Instead of doing it, yeah. You're measuring instead of eliminating. And you said about it put statistics, put the hand, put yeah. All he had a lot. He had a lot of other critiques of using statistics. Another one was he said it takes takes the problem of eliminating defects out of the hands of the operators who are dealing with it every day and into the hands of the engineers who are doing all the statistical analyses. Genius. So there's Shingo for you. Shingo on quality. Yeah, boy, isn't that amazing? Because it's so easy for us to get caught up in all the statistics and everything. Well, you know, we glance at the stats in our company. We glance at them once a month for about 45 minutes just to make sure we're on track. But that's about the extent of it. What we do do is everybody's stopping all day long and fixing what bugs them. All I do all day long is fix what bugs me. I would say that it is completely reasonable to say that I make a minimum of 10, a minimum of 20 improvements, as many as 30 improvements a day, every day, my entire life. That's how fanatical I am about this concept of stopping and fixing the little things. And so I'm going to continue on and show you that. So the other day I got a, a message from a company down in Australia that they started their two second lean journey and they started cleaning the bathrooms. They started organizing their kitchen and they started getting things together. And he asked me to do a special message for him. So I did a special message for him, but I said, I'm going to make this relevant. So when he sent me the email, you know, I was in my yard. So here I am in my tank top working in my yard. And I thought, I'm going to just show them what I'm doing right now. Did you get that? I didn't say I was going to teach them. I said, I'm going to show them what I'm doing right now. I'm going to make this relevant. So this is my life. Watch what happens here. Cool. But the bottom line is, this is going to be one of the most amazing journeys of your life. Why? Because it's going to transform the way you think. You're going to be able to see waste now for the first time in everything you do. Because every day, all you're doing and all I'm doing is a whole bunch of processes. This video is a process. How I take care of my garden is a process. Everything's a process and all I'm doing is seeing the parts of the process that are cumbersome, difficult, that bug me, things like that. And I'm stopping and I'm fixing them. So you take a look at my yards. They're, they're, they're really unbelievable and they almost seem insurmountable to take care of anything at this level, but it's really not. And the reason why is because I am constantly improving everything I'm doing. So when you look at the way we have our Kubota set up, we have all of our tools right on top. We even have all the tools GPS tape with green. So if I see that knife laying over there and I pick it up or it drops out of the Kubota for some reason, I go, oh, that's green tape, that's green GPS, that goes on the green Kubota. Everything is GPS taped, including all the shovels, all the rakes, everything. Oh, look at this. I found one that I just put on, it's not GPS tape. But that would be, oh, I gotta go back to the shop to do that. No, I've got the GPS tape right here so I can make that improvement immediately to solve that problem. That's all we're doing. We're seeing the waste of every process, and instead of continuing on and working, which most people do, the lean thinker stops, makes the improvement, and then works. So that the next time they work, they're in flow. They're not struggling because the rake is where it's supposed to be, it's not lost or misplaced. The knife is where it's supposed to be, it's not lost or misplaced. This is lean thinking. This is all we're really asking anybody to do. When you do that, you got a better life, you got a better job, you got a better organization. Everything gets better. Okay, so all I'm doing, again, is stopping. It is the theme. Ono's precept, this is one we study almost every day. Values motion are equal to shortening one's life. I don't want to shorten my life. I don't want to do things that don't add value. So what I'm doing is constantly improving processes so I add more value with every breath I take. 
because I don't want to shorten my life. That would be ridiculous. This is Ono's precept, precept number eight. So what is two second lead? How do we deploy it? Number one, we obviously see everything that fix, everything that bugs us and we stop and we fix it. But here's a few more little details that are important. What is two second lead? It is simple. I took a world-class business concept practiced by the top companies in the world, Toyota, Harley-Davidson, Porsche, and made it fun and easy so anyone could tap into the power of daily continuous improvement. There are three easy steps to become a powerful lean thinker. First, learn the eight ways. Overproduction, transportation, inventory, defects, overprocessing, motion, waiting, wasted human potential. Then you will see these different ways everywhere and it will drive you crazy. Second, you will be compelled to eliminate the waste you now see and make improvements every day that removes the waste in your life. Make it the first thing you do every day. Small, consistent, tiny, two second improvements all hooked together day after day adds up to mountains of more free time, friend time, and play time. You see, there's nothing cool about being wasteful, and there is everything cool about becoming a lean thinker. Third, pull out your smartphone and shoot a quick video to show your improvements to your friends, family, and coworkers. That's it. Prepare to experience the power of becoming a lean thinker. So I would suggest that the reason why most of you are listening to me today is because you've seen my videos online and you're tired of being surrounded by a tornado, a vortex of waste, and you wanna somehow solve and rid your life of this, because this is what we're, most of us are encountering. We are in a vortex of waste, and it is robbing us of our life, as Ono said, it is shortening our life. The question is, are you done? Do you see the waste that's swirling around you and everything you do? I can see it. I see it all day long. You enter into my world, you enter into Paul Aker's world. I, I literally have a near perfect life. It, it would appear that for most people coming in. Everywhere you go from my garage to my shop, to my company, to the bathroom, everything is dialed in. The processes are clear. It's easy to understand what to do. But yet, even in that context, I'm gonna be honest with you, I am surrounded by waste. Waste is swirling around me every day. It's just the laws of nature. It's the way things work. Things go from a state of order to disorder. It's just the way it is. And lean is the antidote to being sucked into this tornado. And that's what I, that's why I stop and fix everything because I don't want to be sucked into this tornado. tornado. I don't want to be sucked into the vortex of chaos that most people operate in. Instead, I want to be sucked into the vortex of flow, of feeling good at the end of the day, like, wow, I got so much done. And I love working with the people I work with because they're jacked up about the improvements they've made and how life has gotten better. So why do we do lean? So I'm on the bus in Japan and we're talking and going around. And I'm asking everybody why we do lean. And the president of a company, Rob, who's got 1800 employees in uh, Utah, he gives me probably the best answer I've ever heard. And this is Rob's answer. It was absolutely unbelievable. So here we go. Rob said, let me see if it comes up here, US Synthetic, he said, why do I do lean? He says, I do lean because I live 100 lifetimes, reducing time and effort. So the, the point is, and this is the way I think, how do I get so much done every day? How do I live the life I live? Because I'm stopping all the time and fixing things, I experience so much more of life. I get to live a hundred lifetime, which most people would only live one. And I can't agree with Rob Moore. This is why you do life. It enriches your life. It is not a program for manufacturing. This is a life enrichment concept, and it is absolutely incredible. Okay, let me let me get that off there real quick. Sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. So I walked into a hotel the other day and I couldn't believe it. I've never, you think about all the hotels in the world and what's the first thing you do when you walk into a hotel? You got to plug in your laptop, you got to plug everything in. Look what this hotel did. Is this genius? 
they put an, an icon, a visual icon, where the plug is on the desk. So I didn't even have to look. I just, it was intuitive. This is lean thinking. Now, I want you to think about this. How many hotels are in the world? Millions? Have you ever seen this before? I've never seen this before in my life. And I've been in more hotels than you can shake a stick at. Why? Because people are not stopping and asking a basic question. Where's the plug? Why am I searching? Why am I searching for the plug? Why is it not obvious when it's the most basic process that everybody has to perform when they walk into the hotel room? This is why lean is only for 2% of the people in the world. The 2% of the people that get this are going to have a magical life because they're going to walk in and everything's just going to happen. They're going to be in flow. They're going to pull their charger out and they're going to plug it in. And it's going to be over. With. They're not going to think there was a, where's the plug? How come they didn't put a plug in an obvious place? Why do I have to bend over to do the plug? This hotel understands lean. So what's my goal? I want you to see waste like you've never seen it before. If you see waste, you'll have the opportunity to stop and fix what bugs you. But if you don't see it, there's no hope. You, the key is you must see waste. And so I'm gonna end the talk with this concept of the airline ticket because this is really one of the most poignant and cogent ways to demonstrate waste. So this is a typical airline ticket that you get. You look at this, it's just a jumbled bunch of numbers and digits and for a dyslexia guy like me, I don't even know what I'm looking at. I got this airline ticket four or five years ago. I took a picture of it on my knee and sent it to my graphics designers. And I said, how come somebody hasn't done a lean airline ticket? So this is Graham. He was 23, 24 years old at the time. And I said, well, Graham, can you design me a lean airline ticket? And in 15 minutes, this is what Graham developed. So I want you to look at that. And I want you to contrast that to what Delta gave me. So what is the difference? Take a look. One is chaos. One's the tornado, the vortex of, of waste. And the other one is a clear process that shows you the order in which you need to perform the tasks you need to do. You need to know where you're going. You need to know the gate. You need to know what time you're boarding. You need to know where you're sitting on the plane. And then you need to know what time you're departing. Everything's standardized. There's graphics. It's visual. It's simple. And it gives you the information. This is lean thinking. You see, I stopped and said, this is nonsense. Now, granted, they're not gonna use my ticket, but at least I gained the knowledge, the problem solving skills of taking their cumbersome ticket and converting it to a lean ticket, which I then have taken this new information, this new understanding and transposed that to everything in our facility and in my life so that I'm not struggling. It's a, it's a very simple concept. And then I had Toyota come to our, Toyota actually visited FastCap. And when they came there, I showed them the ticket and they said, we see some things you can improve. Number one, put an arrow going the direction of flight. So it's even more intuitive. I didn't get defensive. I immediately told Toyota, that's a brilliant idea. And we immediately made the change. Within 15 minutes, all these changes were made, put back into my PowerPoint and I showed it to, to Toyota and they were blown away that we moved that quickly. Then they said, add the arrival time and add the date. We made the changes. It was that simple. These are small two second improvements. We didn't say, oh, well, I'm gonna put that on a list and do it. We did it immediately. We stopped and fixed it. I went to Canada and when I spoke in Canada, they said, hey, you know what? The plane is the wrong direction the way you have it. So now you have to think backwards in your head when you're looking at it. So flip the direction of the plane away. I didn't get defensive. I said, hey, you Canadians are pretty smart. We immediately made the change and we flipped it around. And then I put it into the keynote before we were done because I sent it to my team and said, switch the plane around. And that, another improvement. And then we went to uh, Germany and the Germans said, I was speaking at Mercedes Benz in Hungary and they said, we enter from the back of the plane. So you should orientate the plane so that if you're entering from the back, it shows the back of the plane. If you're entering from the front, the front of the plane. I said, that's genius. So we immediately made that change. In Hungary, I sent that information to my graphic designer. They fixed the problem and I sent it right back. Well, I was in Hungary and showed it to them. They could not believe it. Why? Because we make all processes easy. If they're not easy, if they're cumbersome, we stop 
and we say, why can't we respond at this level and this quickly so we have flow in our organization? This is the way we think about everything. And then I went to Australia and they said, well, you got the back of the ticket. Why don't you put a graphical of the entire terminal on the back of the thing with a red line showing you where you're going. So you have a visual. So you're not wondering where am I going in this crazy complex that I have never been in before. I said, great idea. We again, immediately made the change. And then another idea was really incredible, the scanning code. So look, look at this. So we put the scanning code. This was in Indiana. I think we put so it on I talk in signs. Indiana, one of the guys in the audience noticed that the scanning barcode was in the top right hand corner. He said, put that same barcode on the backside. So when you go to scan at the airport, whether it's scanning from the top or the bottom, you intuitively know exactly where to line it up when you put it down on the screen. If it's scanning from the bottom, you know exactly where you need to line it up. So clever, another two second improvement. So we keep making all these small improvements which keep enhancing quality and the experience for the customer. And we have internal customers, we have our customers that we work with, we, the people we work with all day long, and all their experiences are being enhanced because we are stopping and fixing everything. So we create more flow. Every day there's more flow in my life and at my company than there was the day before. Why? How I started the talk, because we are a stop culture, not a work culture. We're a stop culture so we can work in flow. So. Uh, and then when I went to Kazakhstan, I spoke in Kazakhstan, this is even crazier. They came up with another idea. They said, put the time zone on the map. And I said, oh my gosh, that's geez. I'm speaking to 2000 people. They raised their hand and they say, hey, we think you should put that on there. So I said, let's do it. What did I do? I sent a voice message immediately to my team in the United States and they made the changes. And before the talk was over, I had the, had the thing and I put it up on the screen. So this is what that looks like. See the time zone, three hour. Just so people know, it's a little bit of information that might be helpful. Okay, so why can we do this? It's very easy because we see waste and we understand the value of stopping and fixing what bugs us. So I'm gonna end it right there, Richard, because I could go on and on for another two hours, but I think we have enough information where people will have some good questions and we can start discussing them. How does that sound? That is absolutely perfect. Um, I'm just sending a note to everyone, Paul, uh, so that uh, they know how to do the questions. But uh, as a prerogative, I've got the first question for you, if I can, okay? Right so, um, we, we tell or we coach or we show people to uh, stop and fix everything immediately. So if you've got a question from an organization and they say, if we all stop to fix issues immediately, the plant would grind to a halt. That's right. What would you say to them, Paul? I would say to them two things. I would say it's very painful to do lean initially. And there's no question about that. But you have to become a long-term thinker. Lean thinkers are not thinking of this moment. They are thinking what their world and universe is gonna look like a month, a year, 10 years from now. And unless you become that long-term thinker and you understand the dynamics of the laws of nature and physics and what happens, when things are perpetually being improved, it looks like this. It's a flat scale and then it goes like this. So everyone's gonna enter into that flat scale area. I mean, I did, that's just the way it is. But you can, you can, you can ignore the laws of nature. You can ignore physics to your demise. It's your choice, but that's the reality of life. So uh, in other words, you're actually going to get a little bit worse before you get better, correct? It's gonna, it, it, could be, it could be brutally painful. It could be. And what I would say is, also, this, this is the second part of the answer, is I wouldn't dismantle the company with big, massive changes. I would focus on the small changes that you can make in five or 10 minutes. And then as your company matures and as you begin to get the benefits from the small changes, the bigger changes will be more tenable and easy for you to, to make. But I wouldn't say, oh my gosh, the whole shop's a mess, tear the whole thing down. I would not do that. 
I would focus on small little changes that are not too disruptive and then work from there. And before long, you'll be able to shut down your whole company, so to speak, because you'll be able to catch up very easily because you've made so many radical improve. You've made so many improvements that have had such a radical in, impact on your company. Perfect. Okay. It looks like a few people are actually uh, texting me the questions because they might be shy in asking. So here's one from Chris, how to keep all 50 employees engaged in lean on a daily basis. How do you help folks see waste? Well, I show you my hands, okay? <laughs> you have to be on the Gemba. You can just forget about being an executive of a large company and having an office. If you have an office, it's a disaster. I spend all my time working with my people side by side. Uh, that's just the only way it works. And when they see the leader engaged and in the trenches with them, they will follow and they will be engaged. But if you're always just pointing and saying, do this and do this, it doesn't work. So that's number one. I'm always on the gamba, always on the shop floor, always doing the work. Number two, we relentlessly teach and train our people. So the first thing we do every morning before we work is a half hour of three essays, sweeping, sorting, and standardized. Our facility is magical. You've never seen a place, it makes hospitals look dirty. And it's a manufacturing plant. So the first thing we do is we 3S everything, and then we have a half hour meeting where we teach, train, and develop our people to become better lean thinkers. And then we work. So you keep people motivated because you do the fundamentals right. You allow them time to improve, you allow time to develop them, and then you work. And then you get on the shop floor with them. Those three things are critical components. And those are, that's our kata. That's our, the Japanese word for routine. That's our routine that supports our belief system that we espouse. So in supporting that, uh, I remember one time you said, you don't have any posters around your company that portray the eight wastes or five S as it used to be, or three S now. This is Zero. what you do, you show everybody what to do. We, we live and breathe it every day. Not only do we have, we don't have any posters anywhere. Not only that, we don't have any posters to say this is the world headquarters for two second lead. There is nothing. We have won every award from the shingle prize. You name it, we've won it. We, there is not one award anywhere in our facility. Our walls are blank. There's no like, leave it better than you found it. There's no like, replace the toilet paper when you're done. There's none of that. There's nothing. What we do have is clear process, eight step processes. If you want to clean the toilet, you go this step, this step, this step. This. But we don't chide anybody or say, remember the eight ways. Remember to leave it better than you found it. That's nonsense. This is embedded in us. This is the way we think because we've developed our people to think differently. Excellent. Uh, got another question from uh, Brad. How do you deal with counter lean directions where there are competing lean improvements or the answer to one person's problem makes it someone else's problem? Hmm. Well, is it, what's Brad's last name? I'm just curious. Robertson. Brad okay, Robertson. good. I thought, I thought it was Brad Karn. I thought he was what trying to. Uh, uh, okay. So. Brad, it's really, really easy. And this, again, is part of like, making sure people understand the fundamentals of lean. And the fundamentals of lean are simply this. Every improvement is measured by four points, period. Four points. It's so simple. When you make an improvement, if you impair safety or you diminish the safety of, of something by improvement, it's not an improvement. It's gone. We're not going to do that. So I'm not going to say, hey, we can drive the forklift, you know, three miles an hour faster and improve, increase our productivity a lot more. But in the process, jeopardize hitting someone. We're not going to do that, right? We're, we're just not going to do that. So safety is number one. The next thing is quality. So everything we do is based on quality. So everybody gets all hung up in this whole lean thing that they think we're doing lean to go faster, to get more productive. 
it's not, that's not what we're trying to do. We're actually trying to improve quality. It's all about quality. So our, our purpose to make the improvement is to improve quality. So if Martha comes up with an idea and Bob comes up with an idea and Martha's idea produces better quality, but Bob's either makes the quality neutral or maybe even possibly diminishes quality, we're going to look more favorably at Martha's idea. Quality trumps everything except for safety. Then the next thing is simplicity. And the next thing is speed. The last thing is speed. It's the least thing we worry about. So let's take a look at the airline ticket, Brad, just as an example. So I came up with an idea. You saw the, the lean airline ticket. Uh, Graham developed it. And then people started adding in. So Toyota said, uh, let's make an improvement. Let's add the arrow. Okay, did the arrow diminish, uh, diminish safety at all? Uh, it really had no effect on safety. Did it improve the quality of the experience? Yeah, it did. It was a better idea than my idea. My idea was just to put, put a line, right? Show direct. No, it improved quality. So we're going to go with Toyota's idea. The arrival idea that Toyota came up with. Is that a better idea? Did that improve the quality? Absolutely, because now I don't have to transpose in my mind time zones and everything else to tell what time to pick me up or what time I need an Uber or whatever it is, what time I'm going to arrive for my speaking gig. So that improved quality. So am I going to fight with Toyota? Well, you know, my idea was I don't think we need that. I don't, I, no, no, no. It improved the quality. We're going to make that improvement. When, when the Canadian said reverse the, the direction of the plane around, I said, well, no, I kind of like the way it looks going orientated up because, you know, we look at things going up. No, no, no. But when I get on the plane, I don't have to transpose in my mind what's going on. The Canadian idea was better. It's better quality. Did it simplify the process? It simplified the process because I'm not transposing anything. So you see, Brad, if you apply this simple criteria, you're not going to be fighting with people on whether or not one idea is better than another because we don't have that discussion at fast gap we have the discussion of which one produces the, the safest environment the best quality the simplest and the fastest those are the criteria that we run through so we're not having a big debate whether or not it's martha or bob's idea or sam's idea it doesn't matter we're looking for the best idea that will serve the customer that's the way we overcome all these issues and it, and it works very very well Excellent answer, Paul. Thank you. Uh, next one is from Justin. If no improvement is possible without a standard, can you explain how you document your standards for the process? And does the standard become updated standard? Okay, so first of all, is Justin was the questionnaire, right? Yes. Okay, so Justin. Uh, we do something again that is almost astounding and again I've never heard of any company doing it at the level that we do it at but there are lots of companies worldwide that are doing this now is every process in our company is done with a video so we take our phone and if there's a process to clean the coffee maker to clean the toilet or set up the injection molding machine we make a quick video of that process there's a qr code right where you'd ask the question so you walk in to the bathroom and you grab the the cleaning bucket to clean the toilet right there not only is there a visual eight step instruction but there's a qr code that you can scan with your phone and it will play the video showing you how to clean the toilet or set up the injection molding machine or run the printer or whatever it is we want to do okay so that's the way we manage that and those processes are always being updated as soon as we find a better way which of course we're a culture that's constantly coming up with better way we're going to take a moment we're going to hold the phone up it's very simple way easier than document it, writing it out putting it in a book closing the book putting it on a shelf that nobody almost ever looks at remember what i just said nobody seems to ever look at those stuff but with the videos oh i'm not quite sure how to do that you take your phone boom scan it Watch the YouTube video. We have a private channel called Fast Cap Training. It's all enlisted. Thousands and thousands of videos. It's staggering. Everyone knows how to use their phone because we trained everyone how to use their phone. Everyone's making videos all the time. We update the QR code. Boom. Over with. I'm smiling, Paul, because uh, one of my consortium members called me a couple of months ago and asked me the same question. And my answer was, why don't you take videos? <laughs> yeah. And, cool. and the, the cool thing too, Richard, about this and Justin, is everything I'm saying to you is on video 
that we've made. We've made thousands of videos with millions of views around the world showing you how to do all this stuff. If you want to know how to do anything, FastCap has made a video to help you. Excellent. Okay, the next question comes from V. Uh, v is going to ask you personally, Paul. Go ahead, V. Yeah, I, uh, how long has uh, FastCap been working on Lean and how did you discover it? Oh, it's my favorite, my favorite story. It's V, right? Like a V, like victory? V double yeah. yeah. So here we go. You ready? So V, what happened was uh, we've been doing it for about 20 years. It started in 2000. So this is a great, great story. So my company started in 1997. So three years into my company, uh, things are going really well. I'm making a ton of money. The company is buttoned down. It's beautiful. It's clean. It's immaculate. It's well organized. I was trained by Bob Taylor. I made 2,000 guitars. I was a manufacturing whiz, man. So the bank president came into my company. I don't have an MBA. I have a degree in education. And I needed a quarter million dollar line of credit to run my company. And banks don't give people like me a quarter million dollar line of credit, but the bank came in and looked at everything and, and the bank president wanted to do the final stamp, walked into my building, looked around, leaned against one of my machines and said, you know, Paul, I've never been in a company so well managed and so well run. I give you any amount of money you wanted. What a nice thing to hear at 40 years old, right? That was a great thing to hear at 40 years old. Oh man, I'm good. A week later, the Japanese walked into my place and looked around and I said, can you help me managing my inventory? And the Japanese said, you're clueless. You don't know how to manufacture and you don't know what you're doing. And so instead of getting defensive, I said, well, what do I need to do? And they said, you need to learn the Toyota production system, Kaizen or lean manufacturing. I had no clue what they were talking about. I brought them into my plant, paid $10,000 a week to have them in there. For two weeks, they took processes that I had set up that were magical, according to the bank president, and took it from 45 minutes to five minutes. Within three months, and you don't ever do lean for money, $30,000 of net profit, not sip, net profit to the bottom line with the improvements in three months. That's how bad we were. That's why they delivered that message. You are clueless and you don't know what you're doing. And they were being nice. That is how bad you are. That is how bad I am. That is the current state of most organizations. It is dismal. It is that bad. And today, as good as we are, we are still atrocious. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I had to unmute myself. The next one is from Anna. This is a really good one. How would we deal with the egos in a company? I mean, how can we change the mentality of top staff to embrace everyone's ideas in the organization? You know, it's almost impossible. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you, it's almost impossible. Lean is for 2% of the people in the world. There are people out there, most people are egomaniacs. They think they've got it all figured out. They're the smartest people. They've risen to the top. They're the vice president, the leader, the general manager. The ego will kill everything. I don't know that you can change that, to be honest with you. What you can do, and this is what I've done, is I've looked with my eyes to find the people that want to change, that are not smothered by their ego. And I get those people into my organization and get the egomaniacs the hell out. That's the honest answer. Okay. So for you, that's okay to do because you're the leader. But right. what about the, the mid passionate people, mid management, passionate people well, that have drunk the juice and, here's what I would, and they're struggling? I, I get this question all the time. Here's what I would do. Number one, focus on yourself. Focus on your work and your sphere of influence and what you could change. Make your world better, your little world better. Two things are gonna happen. You're either going to be tapped 
as the leader to move up the food chain because you're getting way more done than everybody else and you're more effective leader and you're going to move up and you're going to become the top leader and you're going to be able to make those changes. That's number one. I see it happen all the time. The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to realize that you're stuck in a cumbersome organization that is unwilling to change and the laws of nature, you're going to get sucked away to some other great organization where you're going to be able to flourish and make the changes you want to make and you dream about making in your life. Those are the two scenarios. Excellent. Okay, Paul, the next one is from Tony. <clears throat> and this is an interesting one. What will all the improvement experts do with their time? <laughs> oh, you want to know? Travel to 105 countries. Get your instrument rated pilot license. Three North Atlantic crossings. Kiliman Mount Kilimanjaro, Everest Base Camp, scuba dive all over the world, have 13 acres of the most beautiful manicured gardens in the entire world, build five major construction projects at one time, develop 800 products, 800 products and have them in, in uh, 40 countries, have thousands of distributors worldwide, go anywhere you want, do anything you want, anytime you want, have zero limitations and think any crazy thought and make it come to fruition. That's what you do. Perfect. <laughs> so this one's from Eric, who we know well. I love the QR codes and videos for standard operating procedures on clear physical processes around a manufacturing space. Do you have an approach for processes on a computer, like order entry or changes to orders? If someone's staring at a computer screen and has a better question or has a question about a process, where do they go for the answer? Well, I don't know if I got the very last part of that question, but here's what I'm going to say. Nothing makes me smile bigger. Nothing makes me smile bigger than my office staff, my office team in the morning meeting when they say, I improve this process. Because the number one place where people get hung up that they don't know how to improve is in the office. And the truth of the matter is there is zero difference, zero between the manufacturing floor and the office. Every day in the office, you are performing process after process, whether order entry, answering the phone, taking information down, disseminating information, gathering information. These are all processes. Every one of those processes are riddled with waste and are cumbersome and difficult. Our people are nonstop refining every process from how we gather the information to the customer, how we send them the invoice. Our customers say, you know, I got an invoice uh, the other day, Dave uh, Lalonic in New York gave us a, uh, said, I don't like the way I get my email confirmation. You don't have the, you don't have the actual order number on there. My PO number, I have to search for it in the body of the email. It should be right in the actual subject line. So I see it, order confirmation number 5678910 GB, right? That's what he wanted because it made more sense because that was the information he needed to do. And then the tracking information right at the top of the body of the thing. So he just clicks track and it's done. We didn't argue with him. We said, that's a great lean improvement in the office. We, we implemented it. So we're constantly looking for anything that anybody has to struggle or spend a few extra seconds with or kind of ask some questions. So here's a very important concept. We have a concept that says, wherever you ask the question, that's where the answer should be. So in the office, you say, oh, you know what? How does the third hand work? Someone, someone's habitually asking how the third hand works. And so we say, why are they asking that question? How come that information isn't on the website, right on the homepage, right on the very moment they look? Because this is the most common question. So we made sure that video was queued up right in the beginning. So when they ask the question, boom, they can click it. So they don't have to pick up the phone and call customer service and ask them the question. So we say, wherever you ask the question, that's where the answer should be. These are great examples of how the office can improve relentlessly on everything. Awesome. Okay, so the next one is from Lynn, and it's a follow-up to one of the questions that was asked before. What brought the Japanese to your plant originally? Oh, great question. So what happened was, I, at the time, uh, still, I was importing material from Europe. 
And remember, I don't have an MBA. I'm a school teacher and a carpenter and a very small operation. I had three employees. I, you know, I, had, I was a very local business. And all of a sudden now I'm dealing with all the complexity of, of importing products and raw materials from Europe and from Asia and places like that. And so I didn't understand the supply chain thing very well. So I, I connected with Western Washington University, Tom Dore, and he recommended that I get a consultant to help me with these things. The consultant came in and the consultant said, you know what, uh, is, I asked him, is there some software or something that I could buy or something that could help me with all this? And he said, no, but you, what you should do is hire these two young kids who are translators for Toyota, John and Brad, and see if they can help you. And so I said, okay, well, hey, I'm open to new things. I want to learn new things. So I called John and Brad. And they were translators for Toyota. They were both uh, lived extensively their whole life, basically, in Japan. And they were Canadian and South African, actually, as I recall. But uh, so they learned Japanese and they came into my plant and they, they, they helped me. So that's how the whole thing happened. That's excellent. That's fantastic. Uh, I've got, let me just have a look. I think we've got one more. Uh, everybody's saying so much. Okay, so this is from Gregory. Okay, personal ego is the first obstacle we have to get past. As I have personally found this, we are most generally our own biggest obstacle when it comes to lean. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's probably a general statement, Paul, not a question. But let me, so, just make, let me make a comment about that, okay. though, because it's very important. So I have an antidote for my ego. And I have an ego, big ego, right? Paul Akers, big ego. And this is my antidote. This is my countermeasure to my ego. Three times a day, I make sure I say to the people around me, I'm wrong, your idea was better than mine. I literally say those words, I'm wrong, I didn't know that, your idea is better than me. It tamps down the ego that blocks and creates all the walls for continuous improvement to flourish. Excellent. Okay, so there's one from a company called Entech Manufacturing. Do you provide iPhones for your employees or, or are they using their personal phones to make videos and watch the standard work videos? Good question. All, all of all of the above. Everyone can have their phone on them. Nobody's on Facebook. Nobody's doing any of that nonsense because that would be stealing from the customer who would be stealing, stealing from the company who would then be stealing from the customer. Watch my video on cell phone use. It's got 10,000 views. It's very popular, a little controversial. So you cannot use your phone for any personal use at all at work, except for it's on break or lunchtime. You can use your phone because we trust you. We trained you. You understand how to appropriately use your phone. So people use their own iPhones, they use their own, we have iPads everywhere, we have iPhones, they have all, we have all the tools, both, the answer is yes on both. We provide them and they use their own and we trust our people. We don't, we don't babysit our people with this issue. Excellent. So following up on uh, Bradley's question from Elizabeth, uh, what about when one person's improvement causes someone else's job to be harder? For example, the folks posting documents streamline their process so it's easy to post, but it makes the author's job more difficult or the user's experience more frustrating. Well, I think, again, what is the purpose of the improvement? Is it, it ultimately we're serving a customer. So if downstream the customer, it makes the process more difficult for the customer, then it's not an improvement. So I need to understand the very specifics of that, of that in order to, to delineate what makes sense or what doesn't make sense. But really, you don't need me to do that. You need to do that. Your purpose, everything you do. So let, let's give an example. Let, let me think of an example real quick here. So I, I say that I want that video to be posted on the uh, homepage. Okay? I say I want that video to be posted of, of the third hand operation on the homepage. But that makes more work for the graphic designer. It makes less work for the customer service person because the customer service person gets 10 less phone calls a day. But the graphic designer now has to go in and manage that little piece of uh, improvement. And it's going to take them 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to ask the question, which one are we going to do? 
both people are, you know, one person served, the other person's not. What are we going to do? Yeah. Okay. We're going to make the improvement. We're going to, we're going to make the improvement and we're going to knuckle down for the 45 minutes it takes to do it. Or we find out that the, that the graphic designer needs to do 30 of those improvements, but it's going to save 300 phone calls downstream. So it puts more burden on her less burden on better for the customer and better for the customer service people. I think it's an obviousity what, what direction you're going to go in that kind of a situation. It's a little bit like the video we watched uh, yesterday or the day before where uh, the company in China brought the support services all together in one room and all of the issues went away in seconds. So there may be an answer here that if you maybe reach out to the rest of the world when you're doing your process improvements or your two second improvements and see how it affects people go downstream or upstream ask them how can we do our job better how can we uh, provide you a better way of doing the things and then it's about communication as well mm -hmm. so paul so, we're, we're nearly at the end of it i'd like you just to um maybe talk a little bit about your lean play app and let everybody know that they can listen to all your books okay free of charge i will but i have to make a comment about that last thing so i said lean is for two percent of the people in the world some of the characteristics are number one they're not egomaniacs they know how to tamp down their ego and they know how to recognize other people number two they're servants they're thinking of other people and they're not selfish people so i want you to think of that context so it, this is not going to work for someone who's always thinking about them. What's in it for me? This is not the lean thinking. The lean thinker is the servant who's always thinking, how can I help somebody else? How can I park my car more effectively so my wife can get out and not struggle every day when she comes home? This is, these are the characteristics of lean thinkers. And I'm going to tell you, you can come up with all the rules and things in the world. But if you haven't got these basic characteristics in the way you view life, if you're not a grateful person, if you're, if you if your ego is always being damaged by somebody suggesting they've got a better way. And if you're not thinking about other people and you're always thinking about what's in it for you, this is never going to work. So that is a very important thing to understand. Now, Richard transition to your question about two second lean uh, play. So we just developed a new app. We spent tens of thousands of dollars on this and it's all free. And basically I listen to uh, hundreds and hundreds of audiobooks, sometimes two and three a week. I love audible, but the problem is a lot of people don't are not familiar with audible and there's costs involved and it's not cheap. So I said, let's make all my books, all five of my books available on audio plus Henry Ford's book today and tomorrow plus Tai Chi Ono's uh, handbook for, uh, which we recorded and did a great job on audio, make, make all seven of those books available in an audio app called Two Second Lead Play, where you can listen to all my books for free. There's no cost. We don't want anything from you at all. And it's easy to share with everyone. It's in so many languages, it's unbelievable. If you want to listen to Banish Sloppiness in Russian, if you want to listen to it in Chinese, it's staggering. My book is now in 16 or 17 languages. The audio version, I think, is in seven or eight, nine languages now. It's in Italian. It's insane, the resource. And it's all done through the generosity of lean thinkers around the world who want to support this and have done these translations, and it's just amazing. So then we created an app where it's all available. Go to, go to the App Store, go to Google Play, download it, Two Second Lean Play, and get going and pass it on. And it's really, really cool. And we just, you wanna know something we just added that's still in the development phase is you're reading the book. This is very innovative. This is another great thing about Lean. It's an innovative platform. You're reading the book and you say, Paul, I have a question for you. There's a microphone. You can click on a chat and send me a message, say, Paul, but what about this? And I will reply right back to you with an audio reply. Never heard of any author ever being that accessible and having that much of a just-in-time experience. Absolutely. Do you have it in Portuguese? Uh, it is in Portuguese. It is in Portuguese. Not <laughs> only is it in Portuguese, it's, it's the digitals in Portuguese, which you can download, and the audio. And, and ready for this? It's in Brazilian Portuguese. Audio. Awesome. 
Paul, uh, we're just about out of time right now. Uh, on behalf of AME, on behalf of all of the people that dialed in, um, I just want to personally thank you so much for sharing your experience, your knowledge, and showing us, showing us how mm, to do two-second lean and improve. You got the you got the message. It's all yeah. about showing. All about showing. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to start recording right now.